Okay, this is the review for test number two for intermediate algebra. This covers the chapter six material, which is all about factoring. Um, and we learned tons of different ways to factor. Because the practice test is on Pearson, I thought the best option would be to print off the question straight off Pearson. The wording is exactly as it will be on Pearson. Um, but this way you could see me work out the work instead of just talking through it. The practice test comes with 38 questions. Your actual exam will have 28 questions. So I cut off about 10 of them that are a little bit redundant so that you don't have quite so many on the actual exam day. And your practice test will go in order. So you're gonna start with stuff from 6.1 and you'll end with stuff from 6.6. .6. But the actual exam, everything is mixed up. So don't base it on like the order it's gonna show up because it will show up in a different order. Okay, so the first question says write the number 1078 as a product of prime. So this is our prime factorization. And this is where I generally go with a factor tree. And this is where we use those special little tools and hints um, to help us, where if it's an even number, you know a two comes out. If it ends in five and zero, then you know a five comes out. And if you add the digits and that number is divisible by three, then the original number is also divisible by three. So I do note that 1078 is an even number. And so I know a two is going to be a factor. And so then if I think about dividing this number by two, that's gonna give me 539, as long as I did my arithmetic correct, which I do believe I did. So now 539 is kind of an interesting number. It's not even, so we know a two doesn't come out. It doesn't end in five or zero, so I know five doesn't come out. So I'm gonna test to see if three comes out by taking five plus three, which is eight, 8 plus 7, or excuse me, 8 plus 9 is 17. That's not divisible by 3. So then we kind of have a couple other numbers we need to check. Because um, I don't know if 539 is a prime number. It seems kind of large. So let's see if 539 is divisible by 7. Because that's, oh, look, it is. Seven's kind of one of those prime numbers that we always want to check if we're not sure. So... 539 is actually 7 times 77. So that definitely helps us branch our tree down a little bit further. 77 is not prime, so we'd go 7 times 11. Now all of these are primes. So it says write that as a product of primes. So if we're doing that, that'd be 2 times 7 times 7 times 11. It doesn't say anything about exponents on this one, so I would be a little bit weary of doing seven to the second power times 11, but you could totally test that. The nice thing about the practice test is since it's set up as a homework, you do get the three attempts, um, but I would probably default and do this one. Since it says write it as a product of prime numbers, this way all of your prime numbers are completely listed out. So that's number one. Number two is the exact same problem, but now we have a smaller number. It's just 104 that we have to find the prime factorization for. So again, I know that that's an even number, so I know a two's gonna come out, which will take me to 57. And then 57 is not even. It doesn't end in five or zero, but five plus seven is 12. 12 is divisible by three, so that means 57 is divisible by three as well. And that would be three times, let's see, it goes into five one time, 27 left over, so it'd be 19. 19 is a prime number. So I'm actually done. This is not a long factor tree at all, where I have two times three times 19 would be my prime factorization for 104. And you know, on these, you can always check it with your calculator. If you're not sure if that's correct, you can take two times three times 19. Ooh, see, I messed up somewhere. Probably here. Let's do 57 divided by 3. No? 104 divided by 2? Man, all the way up there. See, I make math errors too. Well, that would have worked if it was 114. Let's come over here. You know, I could totally pause the video and cut out my errors, but I like to show you that I make mistakes too. Sometimes I try to do a little bit too much in my head like that. I didn't check to make sure that I had gotten that correct. And so I messed it up. But luckily we are able to check our work 
and make sure that it works out by doing it in the calculator like this. So 2 times 52 will be 104, and then that's an even number, so I'm going to divide 52 by 2, which will give me a 26, and I'm going to check it before I move on just so I don't mess up my tree. There we go, 26. 26 is even, so that would be 2 times 13. 13 is prime, and again, I can double check to make sure 26 divided by 2 is 13, and it is. So that's 2 times 2 times 2 times 13, or if you do find out that you can use the exponents, 2 to the third power times 13 would be that representation for that. So everybody messes up. It's learning from our mistakes. That's the important part, which is why I leave my mistakes in the videos, because nobody's perfect. Okay, find the greatest common factor between a, a to the third power b, and a, b to the fourth power. So on these problems, what we're looking for is we're looking at the individual terms and saying, what do they all have in common? And I feel like you guys are getting a good grasp of this. One thing I would notice, two of my terms have b's and the other one does not. The only letter that all three of these have in common is the A, and because this one only has one of them, that is the biggest thing I can pull out of all of these things. So my GCF or greatest common factor for this would be simply an A, just one A. There's nothing else that all of these have in common. Okay, factor, check by multiplying. So when it says check by multiplying and you're just factoring out what they have in common, what that's really telling you to use is your distributive property to make sure that you can get back up to the original problem. So again, what we're asking is what do our two terms have in common? What can we factor out? We have a 2a and an 8. Both of those are even numbers, so I can factor out a 2, which would leave me with a 4... Mm with, excuse me, just an A minus 4. I put the gun on where I put that. And I could distribute the 2 on the outside back inside, and it should take me right back up here. And that's how we check that work. Factor the GCF from each term in the expression. So when you have uh, variables and numbers, I always recommend kind of looking at them separately. So if I look just at my numbers, I have 10 and 2. Both of those are even, so I know I can pull a 2 out. And then I go and I look at my variables. I have y to the 9 and y to the 3rd. These are the same variable, just raised to different powers. So if you have the same variable raised to different powers, what you're going to do is you're going to take the smallest power that they both have. So 9 is greater than 3, so the most common thing that we can pull out is y to the third, because they both have that. Because remember from our product rule, y to the sixth times y to the third is going to get us to y to the ninth. And so both of these terms actually do have y to the third. So if I take out 2y to the third, that's going to leave me with 5y to the sixth minus 1. We were able to plot this whole second term, so we don't want to put like minus zero or plus zero or leave it blank. We have to have that one as a placeholder so that when we distribute that back in, we get that minus two y to the third uh, part. All right, so number six, factor out the GCF. I'm doing lots of these. So we have 24p squared minus 20p plus eight. So not all of these terms have p's, but they do all have numbers, and we have 24, 20, and 8. So you can do this a couple different ways. You could go with just a common factor that you see, and then you could pull out more common factors if there are more, or you can do... Um, you can do factors, like think about the factors of 24, the factors of 20, and the factors of 8, and then see what's largest that they have in common. Um, it's kind of whatever you want to do. I'll show you by just pulling out a factor and what we would do on the second time we pull it out. Um, if I'm looking at 24p squared minus 20p plus 8, maybe I don't see anything larger than 2 to pull out at first, and that's okay. If I pull out a 2 at first, I'm going to be left with 12p squared minus 10p plus 4. And then as soon as I've pulled something out, I always want to make sure that there's nothing else I could have pulled out. Um, if I look at 12, 10, and 4, these are all still even. That means I could pull out an additional 2. So if I pull out an additional 2, 
then what ends up happening is I would have 2 times 2 out here because I'm pulling out another one and that would leave me with 6p squared minus 5p plus 2. 2 times 2 is 4 and 4 is actually the greatest common factor of these terms. 4 goes into 24, 20, and 8. But I wanted to show you what would happen if we didn't recognize that 4 was actually our largest. If we just recognize the 2 first, that's fine. But then make sure that you check again to make sure there's nothing else you could pull out. And if there is, that's fine as well. You just pull it out and make sure you multiply it by whatever you've already previously pulled out you'll still get to the same answer. There's nothing else we are supposed to do with this problem because it says factor the GCF. That's all we were meant to do. And I'm not gonna write it in that tiny little box. All right, number seven is another factor from the GCF. And this one's interesting because we've got a lot of terms going on here. We've got a five times the seven plus one and then we've got or the 7x plus 1, excuse me. And then we have plus 7 plus 1. So hopefully, just by looking at that, like we have three terms. We have this 5, 7 plus, or times the 7x plus 1, then we have the 7x, and we have the plus 1. But hopefully you see something similar happening. Like, yes, this whole first thing is a term, and it has a 7x plus 1. We have another 7x plus 1. There's just not anything outside of it, and it's not set in parentheses. So what if I wrote it a little bit differently? What if I put that 7x plus 1 in parentheses over here? That hopefully will make it more noticeable that it's almost like part of our factor by grouping situation that's happening to where I only have two terms now, so I could pull that 7x plus 1 out front, and that would leave me with 5x plus, and then this is the part that can get tricky. There's not a number written here, but that's okay, because if there's not a number written there, we understand that to be a 1. Just like if I write x, well, what is x? What's the coefficient of x? What's the number part of this? Well, we don't have a number part, or we don't write a number part, but really there is a one here. We just like to keep math as clean and simple as possible so we don't write that in there. Same thing's true here if I group it up like that. And the reason for that is because I have to have that one as a placeholder so that when I distribute that back in, I still get the seven X plus one up here that I need. And so that is an important little trick that you're gonna see happen. So that's a good one to work out, or a good one maybe to put on your cheat sheet. Okay, number eight says factor by grouping. You should hopefully get the sense that you're gonna factor by grouping simply because there's four different terms at play here. And when there's four different terms at play, you can do groupings of two and two. So we have x to the third minus two x squared plus three x minus six. So if I think about grouping, usually I just leave it in the order that they give it to us. So I would group my first two and I'd group my second two. And then I'm always asking, what do these have in common? Well, x to the third and a negative two x squared will have an x squared in common, leaving me with an x minus two. Now I'm hoping whatever I get out of my second set, I'm gonna end up with an x minus two inside. And if I look at 3x minus 6, they both have a 3. And if I take that out, that'll leave me with an x minus 2. The reason why when we factor by grouping, we want the same thing inside is so that we, when we get to this stage, we only have two terms. And so now I'm looking at the two terms. And the parentheses part is what these two terms have in common. And so I can pull that out front. And then I'm left with whatever was out front originally, this x squared plus 3. And so this would be my factorization, or factored by grouping, of that polynomial that we started with. Okay, factor the following expression. It doesn't tell me how, it just tells me to factor. But again, there's four terms, so I'm probably going to think about using factor by grouping. Um, 4t to the third plus 12t squared minus 24t minus 72. Now, no matter what style of uh, factoring you decide to use, 
although in this case you're going to factor by grouping, you always want to start with asking, is there anything that all of my terms have in common? At the bare minimum, all of these numbers are positive. So I know a 2 is going to come out. But I know 4, 12, and 24 are all factors, like they all have a factor of 4. So I'm going to test to see if 72 also has a factor of 4 by taking 72 divided by 4. And it does. So I can pull out a 4 out of all of these terms. So I'm going to start with that first because it's going to simplify my polynomial that I'm then going to factor by grouping. That's a 3. Plus 3t three squared minus 6t minus 18. And then I have four terms. I'm going to factor by grouping first two, second two. This four kind of just hangs out out here for a little bit. t to the third plus 3t squared. I can pull out a t squared, and that'll leave me with a t plus 3. And now I'm hoping when I factor out over here, I'm going to get a t plus 3. The first thing I notice is both things inside of the first set of parentheses here have to be positive. But both of my second terms that I'm looking at over here are negative. So in order to get positive positive inside of my parentheses, I'm going to have to factor out a negative number. And so I have a negative 6t minus 18. Well, 6 goes into 18. And since both are negative, I'm going to pull out a negative 6, which will leave me with t plus 3 inside, which is what I needed. Again, the nice thing with these is you can always redistribute and make sure you get back up. So now I can factor that t plus 3 out, and then I'll have t squared minus 6, because that's what was left over in front. And this is my final answer. All right, let's do number 10. Same thing, this one says factor by grouping. If you notice, the middle two terms could be combined together and we could actually do it using one of our other methods. So just know if they tell you to do factor by grouping, that's generally the easiest way to approach that problem. Um, but if you approach it from a different perspective, as long as you get the right answer, you're gonna be fine. So we have 3x squared plus 6x plus 6x plus 12. Since they tell us to factor by grouping, I'm going to factor by grouping. So I'm going to, and let's see, we could pull out a 3. Do we want to? We probably should because we've done that on all of our other ones. That way we get, because it says factor completely, so we don't want to miss that. Okay, so now I'm going to look at this term and this term. x squared plus 2x, I can factor out an x, and that'll leave me with an x plus 2. If I look at 2x plus 4, those both have a 2 in common, and that'll leave me with an x plus 2, which is good. So I'll have 3 times x plus 2 times x plus 2. Well, that's interesting. It was a perfect square situation. And we can, again, we can FOIL this. We can do first, outer, inner, last, and distribute that 3 back in, and we can get back up to the top. And that's how you're able to check all of your problems as you work through these. Um, do I recommend checking every single one on the exam as you work through them? No. What I recommend you do is as you do them, let's say there's one that was a little bit tricky for you where you weren't totally sure. On your paper, you know, your scratch paper, make a little list of ones like number one, number 10, number 13. Make a list of ones you weren't totally sure about and then after you've completed all the problems and you still have time on the exam, go back and check those works. Um, that way you're not, you know, hovering and staying all in one problem for the entire exam but you do go back and look at the ones that maybe were stumping you a little bit. All right, let's go on to number 11. This one says to factor the trinomial completely, and we're given two options of either filling in where we have our binomials or selecting that our polynomial is prime. And so I'm, let's see what we get. I'm going to be using the old school method of factoring on everything. If you like the box method or if you like the factor by grouping method, you can do that. But I'm going to discuss how to do it the old school way. So when we are factoring with our trinomials, the first term in this one is x squared, so that tells me I'm going to have an x and an x. 
The sign in front of my C term, remembering that this is AX squared plus BX plus C, the sign in front of my C term is a negative. So that means I'm going to have a positive and a negative inside. And here's the nice thing. 2 is a prime number, so there's only one set of factors for it, which is 1 times 2. So that's the only option I have to place here. The thing I have to remember is I need these numbers to subtract together to give me a positive 1. Since I'm trying to get a positive 1, I need to have my 2 be the positive, and my 1 will be the negative. So when I do FOIL, that'll be x squared, and then I'll have a minus 1 plus 2, that'll give me my plus 1x and then I end up with my minus two. So you can always check on these by foiling back up. All right, let's do another one. We got x squared minus six x minus 27. I'm gonna start the exact same way. x, x, the sign here is negative. So again, I'm gonna have a plus minus. Now 27 has a few more primes or a few more primes, excuse me, a few more factors. We have one times 27 and we have three times nine. Now I want my factors of 27 to subtract to give me a negative six. Well, one and 27 will never work because I'll either get 26 positive or 26 negative, but nine minus three will give me six. And since my six is negative, I'm gonna put my nine with the negative and my three with the positive. factor completely and again we're always giving these two options so we have x squared plus 6x minus 16 x x and again the sign sorry the sign in front of my 16 is negative telling me I have a plus minus now there's lots of factors of 16 there's 1 times 16 2 times 8 uh, 4 times 4, I guess that's it. I say a lot. There's more than, you know, we've had. So, we have to decide, I need factors of 16 that subtract to give me 6. 16 and 1 will never work. 4 and 4 will never work, but 8 and 2 will give me 6. And once again, I have a positive 6, so I need the larger number to be positive. So it'll be 8 and negative 2. Ooh, we're mixing it up now. We got V's instead of X's. Be careful when you're typing in your answer that you don't use X's for everything. You have to use the variable that they give you. So we have V squared plus 13V plus 14. So both of my signs here are pluses. So that tells me I'm going to have plus plus. And then I need factors of 14 that will add together to give me 13. So I have 1 times 14, 2 times 7, and that's it. Those are the only factors of 14. Now, since these are both positive, like if the signs are the same, that means they're going to add to give you this middle number. 14 plus 1 will give me 15. That's not 13. 7 plus 2 is going to give me 9. Again, that's not 13. Since none of these add up to 13, that's how we know that this polynomial is prime. All right, let's do another one. This one's different because we have an x squared and a y squared, but that is okay. We can still factor it the same old way that we've been factoring all the rest of them x squared minus 6xy plus 8y squared. Notice our middle term has the xy component, so it does work out in the end um, with having the x's and the y's. The first thing I would note is that my x squared term is still just x times x. Now, I have a number attached to my y squared, so I can't just put y squared, y squared to be done, but I can go ahead and put these in here kind of as placeholders, remembering that I'm going to have some sort of a number component with it. The sign in front of my C, in this case, is positive, so that means my signs are the same. Since the sign in front of my B is negative, these are both going to be minuses. So I need factors of 8 that will add together to give me 6. Factors of 8 are 1 times 8 and 2 times 4. 1 plus 8 will give me 9, so that doesn't work, but 4 plus 2 does work. So in one of these I put a 4, and one of these I put a 2. 
And again, if we do our outer inner, we can check to make sure we get the correct inside term. Because if we take this, it'll give us a minus 2x. This will give us a minus 4x. Those will give us a minus 6x in the end. All right. Last one like this, which is good because I was running out of space on this page. We have a 4x squared minus 36x plus 80. Now again, a good rule of thumb, especially if the, there's a number attached to our x squared term, is is there anything that all of these have in common that we can factor out first? And the answer is yes. 4 can come out of 4, 36, and 80. So I'm going to take 4 out, and that'll give me x squared minus 9x plus 20. Now that looks like a little bit nicer of a trinomial to factor. So again, my first term now is x squared. So I'm going to have an x and an x. The sign in front of my c is positive, so my signs in here are the same. And since the sign in front of my b is negative, they're both negatives. So I need factors of 20 that add together to give me 9. Factors of 20 are 1 and 20, 2 and 10, 4 and 5. 1 and 20 don't add together to give me 9. 2 and 10 don't add together to give me 9, but 4 and 5 do. So this would be the factorization of that original trinomial, or polynomial, however you want to look at it. And just like that, we've done 16 problems. All right, number 17. Ooh. Write a trinomial whose binomial factors contain terms that sum to negative 16 and have a product of 63. Show the factoring of the trinomial. So we have to make up the trinomial first, and then we have to factor that trinomial. So here's some key words for this problem. Sum to negative 16 and product to 63. So when we think back to how we've been factoring any of these, um, let me go to that last one right here. We found the product, we found the primes of this product in order to, and then we looked at those factors to determine the sum of this middle term. So the sum refers to this middle term or the B term. Product refers to our C term. So if I'm thinking about it like that and remembering that the general format is ax squared plus bx plus c, if my b is negative 16, and they don't tell me anything about my a, so I'm assuming my a is 1 at that case, and it tells me my c is 63. This would be the trinomial that they're giving me based on the information that they've given me in that equation or that sentence. So if that's the trinomial I'm starting with, then I have to see if I can factor it. And here's a good hint. Notice they give me a box. They don't give me an option that it's prime. So if I come up with some sort of a trinomial that doesn't factor, then I've done something wrong. And so that's kind of a good hint. I have an x and an x. The sign here is positive, so that means signs are the same. Sign here is negative, so they're both negative. I need factors of 63 that add together to give me 16. That's 1 times 63, 3 times what, 21, 4, 5, 6, 7 times 9. Well, 1 and 63 would be way too big if I add those together. 3 and 21 is way too big. But if I take 7 plus 9, that does give me 16. So here would be the factorization of that trinomial that we got based on the fact that they told me sum of 16, product of 63. All right, factor completely. We're given the option now that it's a prime. Whoa, sorry, that got really turned. There we go. This one, though, is a little different because we've got a 7 out front, so we don't just have an x squared. But that's okay. 
Because luckily for us, if I look at this trinomial, I have 7x squared minus 20x minus 3. Both of my end terms are prime, which means it makes factoring a lot easier. Yes, there's still going to be some trial and error, and that's okay, but there's not going to be as much. So even though I have a coefficient or an a that's not equal to 1, I know I'm going to have an x and an x. The sign in front of my 3, my c, is negative, so that means I'm going to have a plus minus. So that means I need factors that are going to subtract to give me a negative 20. So the only factors of 7 are 1 and 7. The only factors of 3 are 1 and 3. So some combination of 1 and 7 will go here, and some combination of 1 and 3 is going to go here. So if I just start guessing things, I mean, I could, there's like up to eight options I could try, um, or I guess up to four options I could try. But I'm going to use some logic before I just start plugging stuff in. I need to get a negative 20 in the middle. So when I do my outer, I need to get quite a large number here because that's my negative. So if I put my 7 here and I put my 3 here, that would give me a negative 21. And then if you want to put the 1 in front of the x, you can. You don't have to. But you do have to put the 1 here. So if I do it this way, I have 7x times negative 3. That'll give me a negative 21x. And then my inner would give me a positive x. And that will give me a negative 20. So again, you could just play around with it and you could try different variations of the 7 and the 1 and the 1 and the 3. The most you can try is four different options. But you can also use some logic before you start plugging in your numbers by looking at your middle term and saying, okay, how do I achieve that with these numbers? It worked out a little bit easier because we didn't have a lot of factors to look at. All right, let's look at the next one. We have 8x squared plus 35x plus 38. Now this one is not going to play quite as nice because we have an 8 and we have a 38. So both of these are going to have multiple different factors that we're going to have to try to do. So that's OK, though. We can do this. Um, let me go ahead and set up my factors. I know I'm going to have an x. I know I'm going to have an x. These are both positive, so I'm going to have positive, positive. And then if I look at my 8, I have 1 times 8 and 2 times 4. So there's still not a ton of factors, just a little bit. If I look at my 38, I have 1 times 38, and I have 2 times 19. And I'm going to double check that so I don't mess it up like I did the 104 earlier. Yep, 19. 19 is prime, so that's good. 3 is not going to go in there because that will add up to 11. 4, 5, 6, 7. I think we're good. So there's really not as many factors as we would think. Now, I need my factors to get me to 35. So I'm not going to be using the 1 and 38, 100% sure, because that's already over the 35. So that makes it a little bit easier. I know I'm going to have 2 and 19 in here. So then it's which of these options am I going to have? Am I going to have the 1 and the 8? Or am I going to have the 2 and the 4? Usually I just start at the top and kind of work my way down my list. If I have 1 and 8, I'm going to again use some logic before I start plugging stuff in. If I put my 8 here, then when I do my outer, I'm taking 8 times 19, and that is going to be way more than 35. So I'm not even going to try that one. So I'm going to try 1 and 8 this way. And if I do that, I get a 19x plus a 16x. 19 and 16 does get me to 35. So I happened to luck out that 1 and 8 was the right combo. Um, you know, you may have to try more out than that but we happen to be really lucky this time. So it did work. And again, you can always foil the entire thing out to make sure you get back up to the original to check your work. All right, let's do another one. We've got 20x squared plus 26x plus eight. First thing I'm gonna notice, sorry, I got really turned again. First thing I notice straight out of the gate is all of these are even numbers. So I for sure can pull out a two 
and hopefully simplify my uh, work here in just a little bit. That'll leave me with 10x squared plus 13x plus 4. Okay, so if I think about setting up my binomials, I'm going to have an x and an x, and again, both of these signs in here are positive, so both of my signs in here are positive, um, and then I'm looking at factors of 10 and factors of 4. 10 or 1 times 10, 2 times 5, 4 is 1 times 4, 2 times 2. So not a ton of uh, options, just like in our last one. And hopefully we're able to eliminate some just because of how big they are. Because I need these factors to add up to 13. Well, here's the deal. If I use 1 and 10 at all, I'm going to have to use one of these two options which means I will be multiplying either the 10 by a 2, which will make it 20, which is too big, or if I multiply 10 by the 1, I'm still going to be adding the 4, so this is going to be too big no matter what. So automatically I can eliminate that set of, of factors, which means I'm going to have a 2 and 5. So then I'm just looking at, okay, is the 1 and the 4 going to work, or is the 2 and the 2 going to work to get me my 13? And so I'm going to, honestly, I'm going to start with the 2 and the 2 this time simply because it doesn't matter where I stick them. The 1 and the 4 could have multiple different options. If I put a 2 and a 2 in here, and I'm going to write them lightly and small just in case, I'd get a 4x plus 10x. So again, I'd get 14x. Too big. So I eliminate that one. So automatically, I know I have to use the 1 and the 4. And again, I'm going to use a little bit of logic here. If I put my 4 here, then when I do my inner, I'll take 4 times 5, and it's too big. So I'm going to put the 1, and I'm going to put the 4 like this. And then I'm going to make sure that it's right. Because remember, we can get prime, and then the only factoring out we could have done would have been the 2. So I'm always checking, not just assuming that that works because it was my only option left. If I do my outer, I get 2x times 4, which is 8x. If I do my inner, I get 5x. 8 plus 5 is 16, or excuse me, is 13. So this is the correct factorization of this one. So be careful when you are testing that if you run out of options and you're down to your last option, you just immediately assume it works. Don't make that assumption because prime is always an option. Okay? All right, let's look at the next one. We've got... 15x squared minus 25x minus 60. And again, straight out of the gate, all of these end in 5 or 0, so I know they are divisible by 5 at least. So if I factor out a 5, I'm left with 3x minus 5x minus 12. And now I can think about doing my factorization like this. And here's the nice thing. I have an x. Oh, that's a squared and an x. My sign in front of my c is negative, so it means I'm going to have a plus minus. And then my factors, or the things I'm looking at to factor, are 3, which is 1 and 3. That simplifies our life a lot. 12 has quite a few factors. We have 1 times 12, 2 times 6, 3 times 4. So we're going to have to play around a little bit here, because not only on this one do we have the 1 and 3, which makes it easier for us, but our signs very well could be in the wrong spot. So I'm going to just put the 1 and the 3 in, and then I may have to move my signs around. That's what I know I may have to do. Because if my signs are different, then I will be subtracting to get my middle term. So I need to end up with a negative 5 in the end. But this 3 is going to come into play, so we have to be careful. So I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down and see which one works and which one doesn't. If I use 1 and 12, if I put a 1 in here, I guess I can come over here and do it. I'll keep making new ones, I guess. If I put a 1 and a 12 in, when I do my outer, I get negative 12, and my inner, I get a positive 3. That's going to give me a negative 9. And if I switch them, then I'm going to get 36. It's going to be way too big. So this one does not work. And I'm going to just keep, sorry, my screen went black. I am going to write 
a new one over here where we have the x plus something and the 3x minus something. And we're going to try the next one. We have 2 and 6. So let's think. If I put the 2 in here, maybe I'll make it small above, and then I don't have to rewrite it every time. If I put the 2 in here, then I get a minus 6x plus 6x. Well, that's not going to work at all, because then I totally get rid of my middle term. So what if I switch it? If I do that, I get a 2x, like a minus 2x, plus 18x. That's not going to get me my 5x. So that's too big. So I tried that both ways. So I'm down to 3 and 4. So let's see what happens if I put a 3 here and a 4 here. That'll give me a 4x, and this will give me a 9x, which will give me a 5x, but my signs are wrong. Because right now, the way I have it written, let me write them in here so you can see it. The way I have it written right now, I have a minus 4x and a positive 9x. But I need to end up with a negative 5x. And right here, I'd end up with a positive 5x. So all my numbers are in the correct spots now. Now I just need to change my signs. So I'd have 5 times x minus 3 times 3x plus 4. Now when I do my outer, I get a positive 4x. My inner, I get a negative 9x, which takes me back up to that negative 5x that we were looking for. So this would be my final answer. So this is one of those situations where, while we didn't have a ton of options, luck was not on our side as we were picking our options, and we did end up having to test every different availability. But even with that, it wasn't a tremendously long amount of time. And we could have probably paused and used a little bit of logic like we've done on some of the other ones to kind of shorten that process. All right, that was the 20. That was number 20. So now we're going to do number 21, which looks pretty similar. We have 15x squared minus 25x minus 60. Hey, look at that. That's why it looks familiar. We already did it. Where did we do it, though? Did I skip down, or did we do it on a previous page? Or maybe I skipped. Oh, that was 21. Sorry. We're ready for 22. I was like, I'm mm, pretty sure we just did that one. We're going to do 22 again, not 21 again. We just did that one. 8x squared plus 11xy plus 3y squared. OK, so immediately we got the x squared, we got the y squared. We know that's going to happen. So that means we're going to have an x, y, x, y. Both of my signs in my trinomial are positive, so both of my signs in here are positive. Excuse me. Now, 3 is prime. So there's only one set of factors, 1 and 3. So 1, 3. It's the 8 that has multiple factors. But here's the deal. I need my factors to add up to 11. One thing I notice, 8 plus 3 is 11. So can I put just my 8 and my 1 in here in such a way that it's going to work? Well, if I put my 8 here, then when I do my outer, I'm taking 8 times 3. That's not going to work. But if I move my 8 to here, and I put the 1 here, when I do my outer, I get 3xy. Inner, I get 8xy, which will give me my 11xy. So we didn't even have to consider any of the other factors of 8, or even list them out. Because straight out of the gate, we can see that, wait a second, 8 and 3 is going to add together to give me 11. This all works out. Nice, sweet, simple. Now, some of you might be like, well, wait a second, I would never notice that. And that's OK. You can approach the problem in the exact same way that we have all the others. I really didn't do anything different. But one thing that will start to happen the more you do these is you will start seeing stuff like that that actually saves you a little bit of work and quickens the process for you. All righty, let's get up here and look at 23. 23, we have. 16x squared minus 50xy minus 21y squared. I would be tempted to find something they all had in common. 
like 16 and 50 are both even, but 21 is not. And then fours and sevens and eights. Like, I don't think anything actually comes out of all of these. So we're going to have to play around with all of them. And that's okay. I know I have an X, X. I know I have a Y, Y. The sign here is negative in front of my C, telling me I have a plus minus. So this one will be probably about as complicated as they could come because we have lots of options for our A, for the factors here. We have lots of options for our factors here. And then our signs could potentially cause us problems as well. So here we go. All right, 16, we got 1 times 16, 2 times 8, 4 times 4. So we got three options there. 21, luckily we've only got two options. It's 1 and 21 and 3 and 7. Now, when the signs are opposite inside of here, that means they're going to subtract together to give us 50. So I need to get some pretty large numbers in order to be left over with negative 50. So I'm kind of looking at my list. I'm going to try and use a little bit of logic, hopefully, to help shorten the process. Um, let's see. And what I was looking at in my head is if I take 4 times 21, that gets me to 48. That doesn't get me high enough to have a leftover of 50. So that's not going to work. But if I take 21 times 8, that's way too big. And so that's not going to work either. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to use this 1 in 21 factor. I think it's going to be too big. If I do 4 times 7, that's nowhere near big enough to get me a leftover of 50. But 8 and 7, that's 56. So that would work. And then if I look here, 2 times 3, that's 6. So that would work. So I'm going to end up using these two, 2 and 8 and 3 and 7. I need the 8 times the 7 to be negative because that's going to produce my negative 56. So I'm going to place my 8 here and my 7 here so that when I do my outer, I get a minus 56. And if I do that, then that means my 2 has to be here and my 3 has to be here. So when I do my outer, I get a minus 56. Inner, I get a plus 6, which would take me down to the minus 50. So we actually were able to use a lot of logic or thinking on this front side so we didn't have to rewrite or redo our binomials a ton of times while we were testing out these different solutions. And so that's something you can do as well just to kind of help yourself. Write the polynomial whose factors are listed. Okay, so this one, it's kind of like they're giving us this part they're giving us the answer and they want us to work back up to the polynomial part. So it tells us our factors are 2, 7x plus 3, and 4x plus 3. So, and look at that, right there next to the answer box, they even write it in the way that we would need it to be in order for us to approach it. So I'm going to do 2, 7x plus 3, 4x plus 3. Now when we think about the process that we go through to do our factoring, this number out here is actually the very first thing we factor out. So it should probably be the very last thing we, f we put back in. I would focus on our binomials first and I would FOIL them and then I would apply the two at the very end. So if I'm FOILing, I'm going to do my first, and this two, remember, is just kind of hanging out out there. First is going to give me a 28x squared. If I do my outer, I get 21x inner, I get 12x, last, I get 9. Now I'm going to combine my like terms because my two middle terms are going to combine together. I have a 21x and a 12x. That'll give me a 33x. And then I still have the plus 9 in there. 12 plus 21 is 33. And then I'm going to distribute the 2 to every term in here. So 2 times 28 is going to give me a 56 x squared. 2 times 33 will give me a 66 x. 2 times 9 will give me an 18. And here would be the polynomial 
that has the factors of 2, 7x plus 3, and 4x plus 3. All right, difference of squares. It even tells us it's difference of squares, so we don't even have to figure out if it's a difference plus square situation. So difference plus squares, remember, that's when you have a squared minus b squared. It automatically factors into a plus b and a minus b. So sometimes identifying what those a's and b's are is the easiest way to go, and then it's a plug and chug situation. So for x squared minus 100, if I write that as a squared minus b squared, that would be x squared minus, and then what times 1 will give me 100? Well, 10 times 10. This means my a is x and my b is 10. So when I do my factoring, it will be x minus 10, x plus 10. 10, not B. So if you want to label A's and B's and do it that way to, so that you just plug and chug, that's not a bad way to approach these. Okay, sum of cubes. We got x to the third plus 1. Again, they don't even make us question whether it's a sum of cubes. They tell us it's a sum of cubes. And so again, we have a general format for this where it's A plus B a squared minus AB plus B squared. Let me check with my SOAP method. Same sign, opposite sign, always positive. Okay, so I wrote the right one down. Now, what is our A and what is our B? Well, if I write this as X to the third and then one to the third, then that means my A is X and my B is one. So I would have X plus one, x squared minus x plus 1. Not a super interesting one because 1 doesn't really do much when you square it or cube it and all that kind of stuff. All right, this one again, they are so kind. They tell us that it is the sum of two cubes, but we have numbers at play. So that can complicate things when we have numbers. So what I need to figure out is 64, if it's a perfect cube, what is it a perfect cube of? In your calculator, if you're not sure on perfect cubes and stuff like that, what you can do is if you look over here, there's a square root and then there's an x root. And so if you do the x root, that'll allow you to do cube roots and fourth roots and all these other roots. But notice it's green, so we have to click second and then that. Now look, it already says answer though, and so we have to put something first. And I think what we have to put first would be the 3 for the cube root. Then try that. Yep. See, I wanted to do a cube root, so I typed 3, and then I pushed the x root, and that bumped it up there to make sure that's my root. And then underneath there, I can type in 64, because I need to know what the cube root of 64 is, or if there is one. And it's 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 4 times 64, or 16 is 64. So that means right here, my 64m to the third could actually be written as 4m raised to the third power because we saw in the first chapter we covered that we can distribute that power inside to all of the terms. And then I do a similar thing for the 27m to the third. 27 I know is 3 to the third power. Since I can write this original sum like this, then I do have a sum of cubes. And so again, I can apply my sum of cubes formula, which is a plus b, a squared minus ab plus b squared. And in this case, my a is the 4m, my b is 3n. So there will be a little bit more I can do on this one. So anywhere there's an a, I'm putting 4m. Anywhere there's a b, I'm putting 3n. So here I have 4m, but that's got to get squared. So I'm going to put it in parentheses so I don't forget to square both of those terms. And then I have minus my a, which is 4m, times my b, which is 3n, and then plus my b, which is 3n squared. So definitely something to simplify here. So I have 4m plus 3n, and then if I had 4m squared, 4 times 4 is 16, and then m squared minus 4 times 3 is 12, m, n, and then 3 squared is 9, n squared. This would be 
my final answer for 27. Twenty-eight says factor completely. It doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us if we have any perfect square situation going on or nothing. Um, but I can tell right here I have an x to the third. That's not squared. So I probably don't have like any of these special ones. This is probably just a regular old one. Where I'm going to start first by factoring out what they have in common. Immediately I notice they have a y squared, so I'm going to pull that out. But then I'm going to test as well to see if 256 is divisible by 4. Because I bet you it is. It is. So I can pull that out. But I can pull out a 4y squared, which is going to leave me with an x to the third plus 64. Now this is a sum of cubes. I have x to the third, and we saw just a minute ago that 64 is 4 to the third. So once I was able to pull out what they had in common, their greatest common factor, then I did end up with the sum of cubes. And so then I will still apply this ax, or the a plus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared. Because this x to the third can be written as x to the third, the 64 can be written as 4 to the third. So that means my a is x and my b is 4. So if my a is x and my b is 4, I am still going to remember this though, my 4y squared living outside of it. Inside, if I take my x's for my a's, and my b's become 4's. Since it's just a single number, 4 squared is 16, minus 4x, or excuse me, this would be x squared. I'm jumping the gun. The 16 will be right down here. That's an x squared. And this whole thing would be the factorization. Because all of this is the sum of cubes part, but I still had my greatest common factor that I pulled out first. So don't forget and leave that off somewhere in La La Land or something. All right, we're getting close. Factor completely. Notice that they have it split up into four terms. That's usually a pretty good sign of the, how they want you to factor it. So I'm going to probably factor by grouping because of how they have it set up. But the first thing I notice is that all of these terms are even, so they're all divisible by 2. So I'm going to pull out a 2 first. That'll leave me with 4x squared minus 3x plus 8x minus 6. Because I'm pulling out a 2. And then I'm going to do my factor by grouping. Like this. Where if I look at these first two terms inside of the parentheses, they only share an x. The 4 and the 3 have nothing in common. That'll leave me with 4x minus 3. And then if I look over here with my 8x minus 6, they don't have the x's in common, but they do both still share a 2. So if I pull out a 2, that'll leave me with 4x minus 3. Now both of my terms inside the parentheses have this 4x minus 3 term, and what I'm left over with is the x plus 2. And there it is factored. Alright, factor completely. We have x to the third plus 16x. Immediately, they both have an x, so I can pull that out and it'll leave me with x squared plus 16. Now, 16 is a perfect squared, x is a perfect squared, but this is not a minus. And the only thing that's special about our perfect squares is we have the, the difference of perfect squares. We don't have a rule about the sum of perfect squares at all. And so I'm not able to do anything further with this right now. Later in the semester, we will have other tools that allow us to solve this even further. But for right now, that is as far as we can take it. Which seems a little anticlimactic, but it is what it is. Ooh, the shape one, everybody's favorite. Everybody loves doing math with shapes instead of numbers. Okay, so we got two diamond to the sixth power plus four diamond to the fourth power uh, splot to the second power. So if these shapes drive you nuts, 
then do a substitution. You could say that all of the diamonds are going to be X's and all of these little splats or stars are going to be Y's. Write it in math and if that makes it easier, go for it. If I wrote this in math using the diamond as my X, this would be 2X to the 6th power plus 4X to the 4th power and then I have a splat which would be a Y to the 2nd power. If this is easier to look at and factor, do it and then convert it back into diamonds and splats. If I'm looking at this, I can pretty easily see what I need to take out. I know I have a 2 and a 4, so I can take out a 2. And I know I have an x to the 6th and an x to the 4th, so I can take out an x to the 4th. That's going to leave me with an x squared plus a 2y squared. There's nothing else in here that they have in common. And so now, before I go over here and convert back over to diamonds and splats, I can probably eliminate out a whole bunch of stuff, or at least something. So first off, look, they start off by giving you the original and then the equals. So all of this is kind of just garbage, where it's going to confuse you. They have all that there. So I'm going to mark it out. Next, I have x, or I have something to the fourth power. Well, I had to factor out a 2. And that did not factor out a 2. So I know 100% it's not a. Everybody else factors out a 2, so that's good. But that one's different. That one's a 2 splot, not a 2 diamond. Well, the splot was a y. I didn't factor out a y, so I know it's not c. See how we're doing process of elimination here? And then between these two, I have 2 diamond squared or 2 diamond to the fourth. Well, I pulled out something to the fourth. So it's this bottom one. It's d. So even without really converting back to the diamonds and the splots, I'm able to deduce what it is that we had that's equivalent. So if, the, if this one pops up on the test and you hate the shapes, do a substitution. Just make sure like you make a little key over here for yourself so that you know, okay, diamonds are X's and splots are Y's or whatever letter you so choose, okay? All right. Now we are going to start solving these. This is 6.6 .6 stuff. So when we solve them, we set each of our factors equal to the zero and we solve. And it says type an integer or simplified fraction, use a comma to separate your answers. You do not need to put a space in between your answers or the commas. So I'm going to take each factor, like the x minus 1, and set it equal to zero, the x plus 6, and set it equal to zero, and then I solve each of these separately. So remember to do the opposite of whatever it is because we're trying to get x by itself. So I would add 1 to both sides. When I do that, I get x equals 1. Over here with x my, or plus 6, I would minus 6 from both sides to get the 6 moved over. So x equals a negative 6. So my x's are 1 comma negative 6. Next, we have 2x minus 4 equals 0 and 4x plus 9 equals 0. So these are multiple step equations that we have to do. To get x by itself, I would add 4 to both sides to get started with, and then I would have 2x equals 4. Now I am thinking about the fact that this 2 is multiplying against that x, and so in order to do the opposite, I would have to divide both sides by 2, which means x equals 2 because 2 divided by 2 goes away, whole point, 4 divided by 2 is 2. Now over here, I would, which I'm going to come out to the side so I don't run into this next problem, I'm going to subtract the 9 from both sides first. That'll give me a 4x equals a negative 9. That 4x is multiplying, so I would divide to get rid of the 4. x equals a negative 9 fourths. This is an improper fraction, totally okay. The big thing is that it's simplified, which it is. So 2 comma negative 9 fourths. Now the next one is x squared plus 13x plus 44 equals 4. Do not be tempted to factor and then set everything equal to 4. We can't do that. The first thing we need to do is get 0 over here. So the very first thing I'm going to do is subtract 4 from both sides to move that 4 over to the left-hand side. That way I end up with an x squared plus 13x plus 40 equals 
zero. Now this one is ready for me to factor it, whichever method you want to use. So I would do x, x. These are both positive signs, so that tells me positive, positive. I need factors of 40 that add together to give me 13. So if I wasn't totally sure, I could come to the side and say 1 times 40, 2 times 20, 4 times 10, 5 times 8. And I'd say, okay, which ones of those add up to 13? Well, 4 plus 10 is 14. That's too big. 5 plus 8, though, is 13. So that tells me I'm going to have a 5 and an 8. Now that it's factored, I set each of my factors equal to 0, just like I've done on these last two examples. So x plus 5 equals 0. Subtract the 5 from both sides. x equals a negative 5. That's one of my solutions. x plus 8 equals 0. Subtract the 8 from both sides. x equals a negative 8. But what you don't do is you don't immediately factor and set them equal to 4, because that doesn't work. We have to have the 0 on that right-hand side. Okay, this one is not set up right at all. We got stuff on both sides. Since my p squared term is positive, I'm going to move everything over to the left-hand side. And to do that, I would add 10p and add 4 to both sides. That way I end up with 4p squared plus 10p plus 4 equals 0. Now, the first thing I would see is that everything's even, I can take out a 2. Or you can think about dividing both sides of your equation by 2. When you divide 0 by 2, what happens? Nothing. 0 divided by a number is 0, so it doesn't change anything. I'm just simplifying it before I do my factoring. That'll give me 2p squared plus 5p plus 2 equals 0. Now I'm ready to factor. 2p is prime. Like, I know I'm going to have a p and a p. The only factors of 2 are 2 and 1, so that's nice. If I look at my signs, they're both positive. So I know I'm going to have a 2 and a 1. And look at this. This is also a 2 and a 1. So the question becomes, where do I put my 2 and where do I put my 1? Well, let's look at our middle term. Our middle term is 5. So I need to have these factors come together to make 5. If I put my 2 here, then I'm going to have 2p plus 2p, that only gets me up to 4p. But if I put my 2 out here and my 1 in here, then when I do my outer, I get 4p plus 1p, which gets me to my 5p. So that's what I need to have happen. Now that I have it factored, I'm going to make each of my factors set equal to 0. So I have 2p plus 1 equals 0, and I have 1p plus 2 equals 0. And I'm going to solve these. If I look at my left one, 2p plus 1, I would subtract 1 from both sides. So 2p equals negative 1. That 2 is multiplying, so I'm going to do the opposite, which is division. And I get p is negative 1 half. So that's my first one. Now over here, I'm going to subtract the 2, subtract the 2. And I'm going to not write the 1 any longer because it's really not necessary. And so p is negative 2. So even on these, we can pull out common factors. And actually, it works out really nice if it's not, if it doesn't have a variable attached to it, it really kind of just disappears, which is nice. It simplifies our life a lot. All right. We're down to the last three problems, which is very glorious. I guess I printed off the answer to key two. And oh, I can show you that in a minute. That way you can see something interesting that happens. OK, last three. We've got 3x squared equals 75x. So again, I'm going to move my 75x over by subtracting it so that I end up with 3x squared minus 75x equals 0. And then there's only two terms. So I'm going to see what they have in common, what I can pull out. And in this case, they have a 3x in common, leaving me with an x minus 25. Inside my parentheses, there's nothing else for me to combine or really simplify. I've done all the factoring. Now this you have to be a little bit careful because I didn't just pull out a number like I did in my last problem. This time I pulled out an x. So I still have to set this term equal to 0. 
So I'm going to say 3x equals 0 and x minus 25 equals 0. Now, the 3x equals 0 is pretty anticlimactic because that 3 is multiplying against the x, so we divide both sides by 3. 0 divided by a number, though, is just 0. So 0 is one of our solutions, though, so we have to make sure and include it. Over here for x minus 25, we would add 25 to both sides, so x equals 25 is also a solution. But this factoring out, if we factor out an x or any of our variables, then we still have to set that term equal to 0 and solve for it. We don't just get to eliminate it. Okay, 37 looks interesting simply because we have that 2 that's already been pulled out of the a squared plus 6, and we're like, okay. So what we need, though, is we need to get to like a nice polynomial that we can actually factor and work with. So I'm going to subtract the 11a and move it over, but I'm also going to redistribute that 2. That way we don't already have this weird factor thing that we're trying to subtract 11 from. We want it all to be nicely written out. So I'm going to have 2a squared because I'm redistributing that minus 11a because I'm subtracting that 11a over and then plus 12. And that all equals 0. So I did a couple of things all at once. I distributed, which gave me my 2a squared plus 12. And then I subtracted that 11 a over, but in the process I also wrote it in the correct format in descending order, that way it's ready for me to factor. My variable this time is a, so I have a and a. The sign here in front of my c term, sorry my thumb gets in the way, is a positive. Since it is a positive, that tells me my signs inside here are the same. Since it's a negative here, it's going to be a negative negative. So that's nice. And then 2 only has one set of factors, 1 and 2. So I can go ahead and write those in. Now we just have to play around with the 12 to figure out how this is going to work. I need factors of 12 that, when taken into account with this 2, add together to give me 11. So factors of 12 are 1 and 12, which if we're doing addition, that's already going to be too big. 2 and 6, 3 and 4. So we can eliminate that, that one because it's going to be too big. If we do the 2 and the 6, and I put the 6 here, then when I do my outer, I get 12. So automatically it's too big. If I switch it, though, and I put my 6 here and my 2 out here, then I'm only getting up to 10. So that's not going to work. So I'm down to 3 and 4. So let's just try one. Let's just try one of the orders. Since it's written 3 and 4, let's try 3 and 4. If I do my outer, I get a negative 8. In my inner, I get a negative 3. Hey, that gets me to negative 11. So this is the proper factorization of that. So now I set each of my factors equal to 0, and I solve. I have 2a minus 3 equals 0. Add the 3 over. So I have 2a equals 3. Divide by 2, divide by 2. a equals 3 halves. So that's one of our answers. And then I had a minus 4 equals 0, add the 4, add the 4, a equals 4. So 3 halves comma 4 would be my solutions. Very last one that we have here, it says write a quadratic equation given the solutions below such that the terms of the quadratic contain no common numerical factors. So the zeros, or the solutions that we achieved, are negative 3 and 0. So the way that I recommend approaching this is starting at the bottom and working our way up. And that's how we'll get up to our factors. Because it tells us one of our solutions was negative 3. That tells us that we had x equals negative 3. So if I want this to look like a factor, though, then it needs to get all the way up to where zeros on one side. So I'm going to add the 3 back over. It's like we're going backwards. This will give me x plus 3 equals 0. So that means x plus 3 is one of our factors. Our other one just says x equals 0. So there's not anywhere really for me to go with that. That's like this up here. And so when we got 0 up here, that ended up looking like a factor like this. 
So this is going to be a really similar situation, actually, because we are going to have an x as a factor, and we have this x plus 3 as a factor. Those are the only zeros they gave us, the only solutions they gave us. So these are the only factors. So now we just redistribute, and we get our equation. We distribute, distribute, we give me x squared plus 3x. That is the, our quadratic equation for this one. We don't have a constant term because we pulled out that x. Just like up here, we didn't have a constant term. We had an x squared term and an x term. That's how we actually ended up with this x equals 0 as a solution. And so we are able to work backwards like that. Um, that's actually all of the questions, but I didn't realize I had printed out the answer key, and I wanted to go back to our very first questions for just a second. You remember when we did our prime factorizations, and I told you I wasn't sure if Pearson would accept fraction or excuse me exponents or not? They will. So you can write your prime factorizations using the exponential shorthand to help quicken that up for you.